So that's having a look at um, human integration and a consistent experience across contexts. But we said earlier there will be many identity providers. Each will run its own technology stack. Some will run on mainframes, some will run on mini systems, some will run on Unix, some will run on Windows. Some of them will be running .NET, some of them will be running Java. Um, the technology stack is irrelevant. They can all expose their services to the Internet in the same way by conforming to the same protocols. And we would call the fact that there are many identity providers, each running its own technology stack, as pluralism of operators and technologies. So you can see how we're gradually getting through the laws of identity as architectural principles for the design of an identity system. We will get to the design of the identity system soon. The parties which play in an interaction are you, the subject, a relying party, which is the service provider, the application which gives the service, and the identity provider. We've already talked about the subject that runs a piece of software called the identity selector. We've already talked about the identity provider that runs a service which exposes identity data. The service is called a security token service, an STS. The system which links all of these players together is called the identity meta system. Now you can't buy a product called the identity meta system. There is no such thing as the Microsoft identity meta system. The identity meta system is a collection of protocols which are used to transport security tokens to and from these different parties. When the subject wants to communicate with the identity provider, it will use a subset of the WS star protocols. So the web services protocols, one of them in particular, WS trust, is used to request tokens and to return security tokens. When the relying party is a web service, then the subject and the relying party will also use WS protocols to transport the token to and from each other. Sometimes the oh um just before I move on, the relying party will need to express its policy of what claims it needs, um, what um, what token format it needs, um, what identity provider it's prepared to accept tokens from in the form of a policy statement. So here we have a WS policy which specifies that this relying party wants a given name, a surname, an email and a claim called a private personal identifier. If the relying party happens to be a website then obviously we can't use web services protocols so we have to use HTML. And the way we achieve that is by embedding the policy statement into an object tag. Here's an example of an object tag. And you can see here it says that it's going to request a SAML 1.0 assertion and the required claims are the same as before. Given name, surname, email address and private personal identifier. Now, we did talk earlier about the idea of self-asserted identity. The idea that you could s assert some claims about yourself and those sorts of things are used heavily. Hotmail, Yahoo, Google, eBay, Amazon, they all accept self-asserted identity. So how could we do self-asserted identity using the identity meta system? Well, we talked about the concept of relying party, subject and identity provider. And what we do is we have a built-in identity provider in the identity selector software. And that identity select selector allows us to create our own cards. So here's what the UI looks like in the Windows card space, which is an example of Microsoft's own identity selector software. Windows card space allows you to add a card, and you can create a personal card, as opposed to installing a managed card. A managed card comes from an identity provider, but a personal card comes from yourself. When you, inst when you create a personal card, you effectively create a miniature data store for that card in the identity provider which is running on the local machine. And you fill in your details, first name, last name, email address, street, city, state, postal code, road, region, 
home phone number, other phone number. And we can continue with um, a mobile phone number, date of birth and gender, and even web page. And once we've got all that information, then we have both a card and we have a data store which contains the information that can be given to that card. And that data store lives in the Identity Selector software. There are two degrees of store protection there. There's a, a key which is derived from the system, the system key, and there's a key which is also derived from your password. So in order for somebody to get a Trojan onto your machine and break into this store, they will need to go through two sets of encryption. And I will point out that it's not your password itself that's used as the key. It's a key which is derived from your password and the system key. So the protection on the store is high, um, which means it's safe. Personal cards, the data store for personal cards, have a fixed schema. The reason for this is because the designers of the Identity Selector software, the interoperability profile, um, they could have said, well, you know, why don't we just have the schema set in such a way that the user could add whatever attribute they want. Maybe the user would like to add the attribute of um, credit card number, for example. But it was decided, rather in the way that a communist government works, to protect the users from themselves, to protect the citizens from themselves. So to protect the users from themselves and from doing things which are potentially dangerous, potentially a little bit silly, um, the schema is itself fixed. If you wanted to use um, a flexible schema, then you can use that with um, a proper security token service identity provider running on the internet if you were to build your own or maybe buy a product from a vendor which implements such a service. So there are two types of card. Managed cards, they come from identity providers and personal cards, they come from the built-in identity provider which is in the identity selectors uh, software. So those are the two types of cards, personal cards and managed cards. Personal cards, I just make the claims up myself, so they're the claims that I make about myself. Managed cards are um, claims that another party makes about me. And they have a flexible schema. So, we talked earlier about uh, the fact that there's no consistency of experience, the fact that every time you are asked for your identity information there's a different experience. And we get to the problem of Elvis Presley. As I said earlier, there are 40,000 Elvis Presleys registered at Hotmail and only one of them is real. Um, and that gives us a problem. Self-asserted identity. Now let's have a look at um, self-asserted identity. Um, let's have a look at, in fact, any type of asserted identity. And let's have a look at the idea of tokens. So what is a token? We've already mentioned them briefly. They're issued by a security token service, which is part of an identity provider. And they can be um, of any type. It can be a SAML token, an XRML license, an X509 certificate, a Kerberos ticket, maybe some special token that you make up yourself, some proprietary format for your own solution. Here's an example of a token. Got some attributes in there or some claims. Steve, Plank, over 18, over 21, under 65, and there's an image. That can all be wrapped up in a security token. So we get a security token from a security token service question is, what's a security token service? Well, it's a service which issues security tokens. We need to give it something in order to get a security token. What do we need to give it? Well, possibly a different security token. Maybe we would give it a username and a password. Maybe we'd give it a biometric signature. Maybe we'd give it a certificate. I want to have a look now at how we can use a security token service to issue tokens to uh, a subject and to give them to a relying party. And to do that I'm going to use the whiteboard.